bit of a grab bag, and some people may be somewhat disappointed. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about fisher information and forecasts. Um, and in fact, the fisher information hit the board earlier, but we didn't really talk about it. Um, so I want to say a little bit about that, because that's very important to understanding cosmology papers these days, and it's also relevant for forecasting uh, 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 any kind of experiment, including particle experiments. Um, then I'm going to talk about linear algebra operations and all the things that I know about linear algebra that you don't learn in linear algebra class. And all I'm going to be able to do there is do a very quick laundry list of things you should know. You're basically going to have to look them up yourself. Because I would like to, at the end, get to decision theory or making decisions between models. That might die, but we'll try. It's the old college try. I'm assigning myself 15 minutes for Fisher information, half an hour for linear algebra, and that leaves us half an hour for decision theory, which each of those things could be like two of these lectures. Um, so uh, in fact, at, NY, um, at Flatiron Institute and NYU in the fall, we're thinking of running a semester-long course on linear algebra uh, because there's so much to learn uh, just for postdocs, postdocs and grad students, um, because uh, we don't think we, we feel like there's a lot of things people could know or could want to know in um, data analysis and linear algebra. OK, let's start with Fisher information. So um, I mentioned in one of the earlier uh, lectures, I remember, I, re uh, I mentioned the Kramer-Rau bound. So there is a, a best you can do in terms of measuring a quantity. And it's given by the Kramer-Rau bound. And the Kramer-Rau bound, if you look it up on Wikipedia, is, um, I'm not pronouncing it right, of course, because it's this. Um, if you look it up on Wikipedia, it has a very general description. Because it has, it's a very deep and general result in statistics. It is too general. In some ways, it's a little hard to read this page because it is written so generally. There's a slightly more specific form of the Kramer-Rau bound, which we call the Fisher matrix, or Fisher information. The Fisher information will be a matrix. Actually, it'll be a tensor. Um, but anyway, uh, we're, I'm going to show you the Fisher information right now. And this is also a statement of how well you can make a measurement, but it's with more restrictive assumptions than this. So this is just a restriction of the assumptions to a, a simple problem. But most physics problems fall into this category. Most physics experiments, the Fisher information does everything you need. Um, and uh, I'm just going to state it, but then I'm going to show where we've seen it earlier in the week, because uh, we actually saw this thing earlier in the week. Um, the, again, if you look up the Fisher information on Wikipedia, it is also stated too generally. So I'm going to specialize even further. One form of this Fisher information, which is only appropriate under some conditions, but those conditions are almost always met by physics experiments, is that it is d squared uh, ln likelihood d theta squared. These are your parameters. This is your log likelihood. And remember, the log likelihood on L is the ln of the probability of your data given your parameters. Oh, I shouldn't use I there, because I is often used for the tensor. So let's just call it that for now. Let's drop that second thing. So the log likelihood was the probability of your data given the parameters. If I take a second derivative of this log likelihood with respect to the parameters, and of course, I have to do that at a particular location in the space. So I have to choose a location in the space to take that derivative. So you can either think of this as a location in y space or as a location in theta space. But you, once you choose a location in theta space, you take the second derivative. And this tells you, it answers the following question. Um, it answers the question, how well can I measure the, this set of parameters if with my experiment, with my data, how well can I measure this set of parameters if the true parameters are at this location? And so cosmologists use this all the time. They plan a new survey. They imagine what data you'll get from the survey. They quantitatively figure out what this likelihood will look like. They imagine the cosmological parameters are at a particular location. And then they ask, how 
well, will we measure those cosmological parameters if they are at that location? And that's what the Fisher information gives you. Now, let's talk about this for a second. First of all, the first thing you should do as a physicist when you see something like this is ask, what are the units? And the units are, this is a dimensionless scalar up top. This is a parameter vector at the bottom. So this has units of inverse parameters squared. And if this is a parameter vector, you see how you'll get all the cross derivatives? d by d theta 1, d by d theta 2 of the law and likelihood, which would be the 1, 2 element. So as you see how this thing produces a matrix, which is actually a tensor, because it, has the, it actually has the transformation properties of a tensor. It produces a tensor um, with indices and with units of 1 over parameters squared. Does that sound familiar? 1 over parameters squared, tensor. That would be an inverse variance matrix. So this is like a covariance matrix for the theta parameters inverse. Um, I might put an arrow on that because I, this thing produces something that has the units of an inverse covariance matrix. And this inverse covariance matrix is the best. Is inverse covariance or inverse variance? Because you've said that. Ah, variance tensor covariance matrix, I use them interchangeably. This contains inverse, this inverse variance tensor or covariance tensor contains inverse variances down the diagonal. And whatever you call 1 over sigma 1, 1 over sigma 2, 1 over sigma 1, 2 on the off diagonals. I don't even know what they're called. They just don't have names. I guess, but that's true for the inverse of C inverse. In C inverse, I don't know what they're called. Actually, one of the things that's so strange about statistics, and I've never really understood this, it is always much easier to compute an inverse covariance matrix than a covariance matrix. It's a very deep thing. I'll say another word about that in just a second, because we'll, we'll show where we had it on the board earlier. Um, but this is, ah, is this thing always invertible? This came up uh, last time when we talked about it. Um, it is in a certain sense. It is possible your data contain absolutely no information at all about one of the parameters. So imagine you've done a particle experiment and one of your parameters is your grandmother's age. Um, probably no aspect of the experiment depends on your grandmother's age. Therefore, this second derivative will be exactly zero. That means you will have zero eigenvalues inside this thing. And so technically, that's not invertible. But notice, those will just be eigenvector directions that have infinite variance in the inverse. So though technically you can't invert it, in fact, you can invert it in the sense that if you, if you diagonalize this thing, uh, or find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you can, you can at least write down the eigenvalues for all the non-zeros in it. But that's another reason why I'm always encouraging people in their code to both compute these things and keep these things, because these are better behaved than variance tensors. Variance tensors can have infinities in them. Inverse variance tensors cannot have infinities in them. Notice if this had an infinity in it, it would mean there's a pr the likelihood is infinitely sensitive to one of your parameters, which really cannot happen. Yes? Good. The question is, is the log likelihood double differentiable? That is one of the assumptions that's required to use this form of the Fisher information. It is all, it's been true in every scientific project I've ever done. But the, the, you can get oddities if you want to evaluate this near the edge of your parameter space. So sometimes people, you know, like there might be a null energy condition, say, in the universe, and, and you actually think the parameters are actually close to the null energy condition. You might want to evaluate this right at the null energy condition boundary. That's usually a bad idea. You actually want to pull away from uh, any boundary so that you can compute the second derivative. But that is a little, that's a subtlety, but that rarely comes up in my experience. Yes? Good. Uh, good. There is a theory of that. The right thing to do is actually, if you're Bayesian, the right thing to do is to, um, uh, is to take the expectation value of this. Apologies for that. Um, the right thing to do is to take an expectation value of this over 
over things that you, over places in the parameter space you'd like to be. If you're a frequentist, you can't do things like that. You have to choose a location. I don't know. In cosmology, people choose usually something that's close to the consensus view of the cosmological parameters. And, um, but it, in some problems, it doesn't matter where you choose it. It's identical everywhere. I'm going to show you an example in just a sec. Um, Does that mean if you took the third derivative, it would be zero? <laughs> uh, no, it does not mean that. Well, because it's constant across all, across all uh, Because, uh, oh. If you took an outer derivative of that thing, uh, you ask a good question. Maybe it does mean that. I haven't thought about it. I've never taken that derivative. That's not a derivative I've ever taken. But yes, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. If you took the third derivative, you get a rank three tensor, and it would be exactly zero everywhere in, the, in a problem that, I, that you are very familiar with. I'll show you in just a second. Um, so the point of this is, this is, so this is often used as forecasting. Because, because this is the best you can possibly do. So you'll say, so people will write down, if we take this amount of data, we'll learn the cosmological parameters to this level. Um, but there's a bunch of issues here. One issue is it depends on your noise model. And that's kind of obvious in a certain sense, because your likelihood function is your noise model. Right? The likelihood function is what's the probability of getting different data sets given parameters. That's like how noisy are your data. You see, the likelihood function is basically a statement of your noise model. So this depends strongly on your noise model. So if you're going to write a proposal to the DOE for $6 billion to build a new experiment because you're going to get um, error bars like this on some particle physics parameters, you better be sure you were conservative about your noise model. Because if you weren't conservative, you'll find you get a better uh, estimate than you would otherwise. Yes? We're, we are trying to measure parameters theta. And this is the uncertainty, the inverse uncertainty squared on the parameters theta. So the point is, yeah, that it is literally, well, you'll see, we've actually seen this object a minute ago. I mean, not a minute ago, a few days ago. Um, mean, as it were? Sort of. I mean, it does in a certain sense. The question is, what's the meaning of the first derivative? The first derivative is the thing we set to zero to find our kramer rao bound optimal estimator. Remember, we found the maximum of the likelihood function. We took a derivative, and that derivative we set to zero, and that was the optimum of our likelihood. So it does kind of set the value of the parameters. So would the third derivative be the Yes, in some sense it would, but it, I don't want to talk about the third derivative because I don't know any theory about the third derivative. <laughs> I'm not sure that there is any theory really about the third derivative. And it's a very big object. The third derivative is an immense object. Um, there's another important thing here about the Fisher information. It depends on the parameters, the parameter vector. So if you recall, when we were fitting that the slow, remember we were fitting a line and we were fitting the line as, or fitting that data on the first day as a quadratic. Imagine we thought the cubic term was zero, so we could ignore the cubic term. And imagine another investigator believes, well, maybe there is a cubic term and puts it in. Even if we evaluate the data in a place where there's no cubic term, we evaluate this where the theta for the cubic term is zero. The fact that your friend included the cubic term in the Fisher information calculation means they will get different information. Because some of the information in the data is used to constrain that cubic term. If you're only fitting to squared term, you're using all the information in the data to compute the zeroth term, the first term, and the second term. Whereas your, your competitor is trying to use the information in the data to constrain the first term the zeroth, first, second, and third terms, some of the information in the data goes into that third term, and that means you don't do as well on the second. So different investigators, and this is a big problem in cosmology, in cosmology, different projects make different projections because they're differently conservative about what they let to float and what they hold fixed. If you assume the universe has flat geometry, you get better constraints than if you don't assume that. Because if you don't assume it, you're forcing the data to find it in a certain sense. Does that make sense? Um, so that's another sense in which this is yet another place where statistics problems, which seem very objective, are actually extremely subjective.
Um, and this is purely frequentist. There's no Bayesian thing here at all. This is a frequentist estimate of how well you'll do, and it's still extremely subjective. So it's just an important thing to remember that when you do compute such things, you've made a lot of choices. And by the way, if somebody shows you a Fisher matrix that you don't like, one of the questions you can ask is, what parameters did you let free when you made that? And shouldn't you have also let these other parameters free? And what would change if you did that? And that's the kind of due diligence you have to do when you compute Fisher information. Yeah. So you just said that adding more parameters would make have worse bounds. But my understanding is that the more parameters you add, the better you fit you're going to get, just by definition. Ah, the question is, when you add more parameters, don't you get a better fit? Why does it get worse? It's true that as you add more parameters, you fit the data better, but you constrain each individual parameter worse. And that's a subtle difference. Actually, one of the interesting things about, well, let me show you one thing. Do you remember last, in two times ago, we said that the, our parameters, our best fit parameters, I'm going to put this in a bubble because you're like remembering this. Um, the parameters look like this, M V inverse, M transpose V inverse M inverse, M transpose V inverse data. Remember that? Remember that formula? This is C inverse inverse. This is the Kramer-Rau bound right here. Why? Remember this thing was the model components in columns? And this thing's the model components in columns? Well, guess what the model components are? They're the derivatives of the model with respect to the parameters. And the square of them, in, this, in the simple case of linear fitting, becomes the second derivative. So this thing is the second derivative likelihood function. Or another way to say it is, if you think about taking the derivative twice with respect to theta, you get the uh, model components out for the first derivative, and then you get them out again in the second derivative. And so you get model components squared. So this is the Kramer, this is the Fisher information inverse. Well, it's inversed there, you see. Um, but the thing inside the box is the Fisher information inversed. Um, and notice, and this relates to your, the question you just asked, notice this thing doesn't touch the data. There's no data in here. It's a statement purely about your model and your noise model. This is your noise model. This is your model of the data. You see, this is why you can use it to forecast new experiments. You just need to have a noise model and expectation values, and you can compute how well your experiment is going to do. And so this is a me measure of how well this experiment could do. And of course, remember, in writing this down, we had a boatload of assumptions. Remember all the assumptions? Po the, Points were drawn from a, lot of a, a curve, and, and the, the points had Gaussian errors, and we knew the Gaussian errors. and all. Remember all those assumptions? All of those assumptions are inside this object as well. So though this is the Fisher information for that problem, the Fisher information is laden with assumptions. Um, and all the proofs about the Fisher information are only valid under the assumption that the assumptions are correct, which isn't true in general. Um, but it's a usual thing in statistics. You only can do as well as your model is good and all that stuff. Um, uh, yes? Isn't that odd? It's because the, da the data only comes in at second order. Remember, this thing is a quadratic. This, is a, this was a Gaussian yesterday, or two days ago, this was a Gaussian. The log of it is a quadratic. Take two derivatives of a quadratic, all the data are gone. So the data all just fell away. Now, in more complicated likelihood function, there will still be some residual properties of the data still in this object, for sure. But in many experiments, it is, this thing is very weakly dependent on the data because the curvature at the peak in the likelihood, or the curvature of the likelihood function is really more dependent on the noise model than the data themselves. So in the linear fitting case, linear Gaussian fitting case, that is exactly true. And in other cases, it's only approximately true. OK, good. There's an infinite more to say about that. There's also a lot of things to say about sub Pro, uh, like, if you want to ask about subparts of the parameter space, how do you marginalize out the parts you don't care about? There's all sorts of issues. They are, uh, there's a set of papers in the cosmology community about Fisher matrix analyses. So, and cosmology literature is very good on this and talks through all those things. So, so uh, uh, if you have any trouble finding such things, just send me email. Um,
One name I associate this with is Stark. Of course, there's a million people in the world called Stark. So it's quite hard. And there's many Starks who work in cosmology. Uh, but anyway, there's some papers about Fisher matrices by Stark that are excellent. Um, uh, good. Uh, I want to move to linear algebra. And actually, this is not a bad place to move, to place to start. Because notice I have this Fisher information here, and I need to take the inverse of it. And in general, imagine that some of my parameters were temperatures. Like, I work in stars sometimes, and some of my tem parameters are temperatures, and some of my parameters are, like, oxygen abundances and various things. And these things differ in magnitude by, you know, I know, 14 orders of magnitude between how you measure a temperature and how you measure it. And therefore, since this thing has units, this matrix, if you just naively write down this matrix, you'll find it's very badly conditioned. Because temperatures are measured in thousands of Kelvin, and oxygen abundances are measured in 10 to the minus 9 units, you know, or 10 to the minus whatever units. And so um, if you just naively construct this matrix, it's very ill-conditioned. You have to think about how you're going to do these inverses. And that's one of the many places where uh, linear algebra raises its head in data analysis. There's lots more places. Also, in general, when you do this operation, you should not construct this object, invert it, and dot product it into that object. That is not how you should do this. OK, good. So let me say a few things about like, the things I know about linear algebra. And I'm going to just laundry list it. Uh, I'm going to laundry list it. You're going to have to look things up if you want to go in more detail. Uh, because as I said, this could turn into a semester-long course. And there's a lot of other things I'm not even putting in my laundry list. So the first piece of, la of laundry is, is never, never invert. always solve. That is, you never want to do dot inv m comma x. You always want to do solve m x. This operation tries to make a representation of the inverse matrix that's subject to all of the numerical issues of numerical math, and then do a dot product, this tries to find the value of m inverse that is most accurate, m inverse x that is most accurate given the, your representation. So this is always a better operation than that. Okay? So in fact, you should audit your code for any cases of matrix inversion and remove them. You should never use the inverse operator. It actually pisses me off that it even exists. When is the only time you ever might want an inverse of a matrix? It might be that you want to run this operation over and over again. So you might want to run this operation over and over again. So I'm just going to store m inverse and so that I can apply it to lots of different vectors. Don't do that. The better thing to do is if you need to do dot inv m x uh, let's call it y, et cetera. You might be tempted to just keep inverse m and reuse it, but that's not the right thing to do. Instead, what you should do is use a solver, use a solve that takes a factorization. Meaning, what you do is you factorize m into, it's a factorization, usually Cholesky is the standard. If you use Python, this is called ChoSolve. And what it does is it takes a Cholesky factorization of the matrix and does the solve operation using that Cholesky factorization. You can reuse the same factorization. That saves you the time, but you don't lose the precision you lose if you go to inverse. So once again, Never use inverse. There's never a place in your code where inverse is a good idea. I can't say that strongly enough. Now, of course, I can't open my phone. Sorry, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Ah, yes. Lo <laughs> Solve and inverse are exactly the same computational complexity for the general matrix. If you know that your matrix is diagonal, you shouldn't use either of those. Um, now, 
there are lots of intermediate cases. There's a lot of edge cases. So I won't make a completely general statement. But for arbitrary, like if you build random matrices, the, these two operations are the same level of computational complexity. So it's not going to cost you any time. This costs you a tiny bit of time. Using Cho, Cho solve instead of keeping the inverse costs you a little bit of time, but not very much. Um, not enough that it's worth wasting the numerical accuracy on it. Um, uh, related to both of these things, there's something called condition number, which is the, it's essentially the largest eigenvalue over the smallest eigenvalue. And if this condition number is greater than something like 10 to the 6, you should be worried. And if it's greater than 10 to the 15, you're dead. So you should consider rescaling your axes. Remember, these objects are, live in the world of linear algebra. So you can do rotations and rescalings, do your linear algebra, and then come back. And you should do that. Try to get your condition numbers less than 10 to the 6. Even 10 to the 6, many linear algebra people would be a little concerned. But in my experience, you can usually survive at 10 to the 6, but you cannot survive at 10 to the 12. So I got a question. Yeah. Uh, for an arbitrary matrix, it's hard to calculate eigenvalues. How do you know what <laughs> Yeah. I mean, actually, measuring the eigenvalues is no harder than these inv and solve steps computationally. So the condition number takes the same amount of computation as doing the solve step. In fact, you can infer the condition number with a few solve steps. There's some cute things where, um, where you can find your largest eigenvalues using solve steps if you need to, largest and smallest. But, um, uh, but in general, yeah, if you really have matrices where it's very hard to do this, you have other problems. If it's hard to compute this, you have other problems. You're going to have a lot of trouble computing that as well. And you're going to have a huge amount of trouble checking whether your answer to that was correct, if you know what I'm saying. We do do things with matrices that are tens of thousands by tens of thousands sometimes, but we are very careful with them. And we usually try to put them into different kinds of representations and stuff. It's, uh, if you're really going to big matrices, there's a lot to learn. You can't just jump in and work with 10,000 by 10,000 matrices. Even 1,000 by 1,000, you can rarely get the right answer. Yes? This might be a dumb question, but say I have a condition number like 10 to the 12. How do I know, how, what do I do other than just like guessing trial and error, trying to make adjustments on the condition numbers? Good. And we need to definitely reduce that, like uh, no, there, right? And that is a big ser serious uh, subject of study. So people are interested. Like uh, the best way to recondition your matrix is to multiply it by its inverse. <laughs> Good, you got the joke. <laughs> exactly one person got that joke. Um, you need to know your condition number to get the inverse. But if you knew the inverse, you'd precondition by pre-multiplying by the inverse. Then the inverse of that thing would be the identity matrix. Then you'd re-multiply in the inverse, and you'd have your inverse. Actually, you already had your inverse. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's a literature, there's a big literature on preconditioning. It's a very complicated area. But often, when you have bad condition numbers in physics, it's just because things have different units. And just scale out your unit. Try the simplest things first. Yeah, just try to make things dimensionless. Try to make it so your different dimensions have similar ranges in them. If one of them has a range of 10 to the 9 and one of them has a range of 10 to the minus 9, you're generically going to get a condition number that is 10 to the 9 over 10 to the minus 9 cubed, I mean squared. So you would have 10 to the 36 or whatever. Um, and all you'd have to do is rescale and you'd be close to 1 again. Good. Um, but but I, I'm, I am being very heuristic. I'm going to get heuristic here because most of the things are kind of heuristic. You have to kind of discover you have issues and play around with fixing them. Yeah. Mass matrices where you don't uh -huh. really get a really small mass Yes. Yeah. Thing. Good mass yeah, matrices. Yeah. Yeah. How would any kind of yeah. So, um, uh, mass matrices, I haven't thought about them in detail. And of course, when your matrix is only, say, three by three and you're dealing with the neutrino masses, none of this matters very much because you can actually manually, theoretically produce the inverse of a three by three. You could literally sit down and do it. Um, but if it matters inside your code to have numerically stable things, I think you're going to want to precondition even a mass matrix. So precondition it, invert it, do your operations, and then uncondition at the end. I think we'll be better. So is that why a lot of the technology are randomly, like, they take the log or whatever, so like, they take the LN thing? 
parameters? Yeah, and, and the question is about rescale or redefining parameters. Yeah, people often reparameterize to get their parameters to be order unity. Yeah, and I think that's, but the more important thing usually in these things is not that the parameters are order unity, but that the variation in the parameters is order unity. So meaning, when you take the second derivative, you're moving of order unity to get of order unity a change in log likelihood. Um, it's more that that matters. Um, uh, good. Oh, yeah. Next thing. Very common situation in data analysis that comes up all the time is that you have a matrix that is something like A plus um, R C R transpose or something like this, where this is, a, this, is, this is something that's low rank, and this is something that you know the inverse of. For instance, this might be diagonal. So you, this happens all the time in my work, that I have something that's either diagonal or has a simple or known inverse, and I'm adding to it something that's low rank, meaning this thing is like you know, a three by three matrix that's being expanded up. This might be like a PCA basis or something that's being expanded out into my data space. So I'm like, working in a low rank PCA basis, and I'm, I'm doing some operation, and I'm trying to get the inverse of this object. And I know the inverse of this, and I know this is low rank. That situation comes up a lot, and when it does, do not just fire up linear algebra. Look at the, what's called the matrix inversion lemma. I think it's got a name like the Woodbury formula. As you know, I don't like things being named after people. But it's, but it's also co colloquially called the matrix inversion lemma. And beautifully, there's also a matrix determinant <coughs> lemma. Meaning you can, you can get the inverse of this and the determinant of this very inexpensively. Far more inexpensively than doing it yourself. So um, these matrices, these lemmas are very useful. An example for what? For the low rank thing, like say I'm working in P something something space? Uh, my, examples are all, my examples are all of the following form. Here's an example. This might not mean anything to you, but when we look at a star, the noise, we've been measuring the brightness of a star. This is something we do a lot. In fact, Zach at the back there is one of the world's experts on measuring the brightness of a star. Um, uh, we measure the brightness of a star. Some of the noise, every m measurement is independent. So that means I have a diagonal variance here where every object is independent. But then in addition to that, I think the star is varying in a correlated way, but that's low rank. So my estimate for the noise in the star has a diagonal part and a low rank part. And this is an estimate of the variance tensor, and I want the inverse variance. This is trivial to inverse because it's, it's diagonal, and this thing's low rank because my description of what stars do is low rank. So that's kind of a typical example that we have. But it comes up a lot. But another place it comes up is row editing. What does row editing mean? It means I've done the operation solve uh, m comma x, and now what I want to do is modify one row and column of m, and now I want to do solve m prime x. So oh, I had m, I, and I've done this solve operation. And now I want to do, just modify, update this very slightly to a very similar matrix with only a tiny change, and then I do it again. That, um, that operation can be expressed as a low rank update. If you think about it, you can put this, this change in as a low rank adjustment to the matrix, and then this reduces to a problem we've solved previously. This comes up all the time in data analysis, where you're, doing, you're trying a hypothesis and then a slightly different one and a slightly different one and a slightly different one, and your hypotheses are very similar. Um, so you really are just making small adjustments to this matrix as you go. Hugely useful. Remember I told you that we did this project where we searched the 
Kepler data for billions of different hypotheses, different possible planet hypotheses. This is how we made it tractable. Every hypothesis was related to every other hypothesis by simple row swapping. Um, and so we could then capitalize on it. And the nice thing is, this row, these uh, low rank things here also carry into the factorizations. So if you factorize the matrix, you can actually update the factorization with a low rank update to the factorization. So these low rank things are just outrageously valuable. These are actually one of the key pieces of technology we use in linear algebra. What exactly qualifies as low rank? It's a quantitative question. So these, these theorems, these lemmas, have a computational complexity that depends on the size of this object and the size of this low rank object. And so there's a switchover point. So if this is, if this is 30 dimensional, and this is three-dimensional, it will help you enormously. But if this is 30-dimensional and this is 29-dimensional, it won't. Ah, that, these R's are implicitly uh, rectangular here. Oh, I see. I thought you were putting the R's, it was 29. Yeah, yeah, no, no, the C is low rank. Um, so there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a computational cr crossover, which is the right place to do it. We are, of course, very empirical. We just check whether it works. But in most cases, we're solidly in the range. Like, this will be seven-dimensional, and that'll be 50-dimensional. Or actually, in the Kepler case, this is 70,000, and this is, like, 500. Um, it's always going to be a comparative metric. So what if A is also three-dimensional? Yeah, it's, it's always comparative between A and C. Then, yeah, then none of this matters. Okay. Everything only matters in high dimensions, yeah. Woodbury, yeah. It is in, yeah, that's a good comment. Uh, Sher did you say Sherman Woodbury? Yeah, I know the name Woodbury because that's I, what I associate with it. But yes, it's in numerical recipes. By the way, numerical recipes is good on a lot of this stuff. Um, and it's very good on Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia is excellent for all these things. In fact, we get all of our technology from Wikipedia. The challenge is to figure out what to search for. But what, and, and that's what I'm, at, what I'm telling you right now. Are search, what, what you're really getting here are search terms, not solutions. Um, uh, condition number, factorization, show solve, row editing, low rank, uh, lemma. Those are words you're looking up. OK, good. Um, one last thing. One last thing. Wow, I am actually nailing this. One last thing is, uh, is sparsity. Now, there, to say anything general about sparsity here would be very hard. But I want to say a couple, I will say some very heuristic things. The first thing is, if much, much greater than a half of your matrix elements are zero, you should not be using generic tools. <coughs> Don't use generic tools. And sometimes you have a pro pro place where much greater than half of your matrix elements are so small that from the point of view of numerical precision, it isn't actually worth carrying them around. Now, how you'd make that judgment is not trivial. And, and I'm not going to tell you how to make that judgment because it's somewhat problem dependent. But um, we do have problems. I have an image. Um, I told you I work on imaging problems. We have an image modeling system that explicitly truncates low values in the matrix so that we can use sparse linear algebra. So if, more than a, if much more than half of your matrix elements are 0, that's supposed to say 0, or you can zero out much more than half. And by much more than half, I mean like 95%. By the way, this is very, very common. Uh, in, the reason it comes up in image processing is imagine you have a big image, and you're trying to model this star. So your data is this huge image, and your model is this one star. Most of the pixels in this image do not talk to this star at all. So most of the elements in the design matrix are 0 or unbelievably close to zero. And then I have another star over here, which does affect this pixel, but it doesn't affect any of these pixels. So if you think about modeling an image with a lot of stars, you have a lot of stars and you have a lot of pixels, but almost no pixel touches any individual star, and almost no individual star touches any individual pixel. Almost all the elements, like at a factor of 10 to the 6, are zero. So like one part in 10 to the 6 of my design matrix is non-zero. 
then you really, really, really don't want to be talking about um, uh, just running solve or whatever. Um, one of the nice things is SciPy has a, uh, if you're in Python, SciPy sparse um, exists, which is a package in SciPy that does sparse linear algebra. But what is this calling? This is calling some very generic uh, sparse linear algebra routines, which are all part of not laypack, but one of the big ones. Any anyway, one of the big packages of linear algebra systems. By the way, there's a set of applied mathematicians in this world who are giving their lives for your linear algebra. All the linear algebra that you run, solve, cho solve, all that stuff, what are they doing? They are calling packages that are painstakingly written by applied math, maintained by applied math, and you give no credit ever to any of the people who write those. In fact, it's hard to even find out who the authors are. After, we, when we were doing our stuff, where we were doing these massive searches in Kepler, we were just trying to find out who could we thank? And it was hard to even follow it down. Yeah. Um, so I don't know them all. The very, the very big ones are LinPack and LayPack are the big, um, are the big linear algebra packages, but they don't contain quite everything. But one thing I should say about that, and I don't know much about these back end, like I don't know much about the back end, I just know that it's incredible. Um, but one thing that's interesting about these packages, these are like C, these are uh, either Fortran or C. I think they're vanilla C. I think they're ANSI C packages. They're written as bare bones as possible because they're supposed to be blindingly fast. And the fundamental operations are these basic linear algebra operations, the blahs. These are built on these blahs. How fast your SciPy sparse works mm -hmm. depends entirely on how well compiled these things are on your machine. And if linear algebra is your limiting step in your, co in your code, you should sit down for two days and work out how to compile the living daylights out of these. You should learn exactly what your processor is, exactly what the best compiler is. You might have to pay money for that compiler. It's worth paying the money for the compiler to compile the living crap out of these. Because you can get huge factors if these are correctly compiled. And it's a big difference. So you should talk to, if you work inside a data center, you should talk to your IT people and you should ask them just how much research they did into compiling LinPack and LayPack and just make sure that somebody takes it very seriously. Because we got, we got substantial factors by just improving our compilations of these things. Um, and one of the reasons is when you get down to this really low level stuff of just moving, your, what are the basic linear algebra operators doing? They're basically taking dot products of, of, uh, of vectors. You can imagine there's the, there are right ways and wrong ways to take dot products of vectors that depend on the specific shape of your cache on your chip. If you think about it, you know, you're going to be, you're moving numbers out of addresses. It matters what order you do it. Um, and that's why the best compilers make a difference here. Um, that's a longer story, which I don't know very much about. I, I, my, um, I'm a high end user of these things, not a low level user of these things, but, but um, some of the people I've worked with have really improved our lives. Oh, another thing that I should just say about how good these are. Um, there's a, a, a linear algebra, there's an applied math class at NYU um, where the first few problem sets are to do row reduction on a matrix. And then, and then the, the, the next problem set is like um, all sorts of tricks that make it enormously faster. And then the next problem set is a bunch more tricks that make it faster. And then the next problem set is more tricks. So by the fourth week, you think you are a god of linear algebra because you have the f on blazingly fast uh, a solve, it's to run the, write the solve thing. So you have this blazing fast solve, and then you compare to this and it crushes you. These things are really good. They are the best, the best. I mean, those, I mean, people literally have given their academic lives to those things. It's incredible. Yes? This is a simply unrelated thing. You were talking earlier about how you've had small elements and you have people who just do trucking them automatically because of functional purposes from numerical accuracy, they were zero. Yeah. What if those small numbers are important? Ah, uh, good. How do you preserve the numerical good. accuracy on a 
Good. So uh, the question is, if you wanted to sparsify your matrix, what you would do is zero out things. How do you know you're not zeroing out things that in the long run matter? The, 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 the short answer is you have to test the, if you're zeroing out things in your matrices, and we do this sometimes, you have to be very careful. So you have to write down heuristics for zeroing things out, parameterize those heuristics, and check that your answers don't depend on what heuristics you're using. Um, so that, and I, and I think testing that, Whenever you're playing games like that, you are playing with fire. So you have to be careful about how you play those games. Um, and so I'm recommending, if people do that, you want to do it with extreme caution. But I have to say, this was recommended to me, zeroing out things was recommended to me by applied mathematician, who also said the following thing. Imagine you have an enormous set of numbers and you want to add up an enormous set of numbers. And the enormous set of numbers is like really enormous. Let's say it's a billion numbers or a trillion numbers and you need to sum them. And so like you're summing in the data center. And the numbers have an enormous dynamic range. Some of them are you know, 30 orders of magnitude smaller. Some are 16 orders of magnitude smaller, whatever, than the largest numbers. So imagine it's just huge dynamic range. What's your best move? How should you do this? And, and it turns out that from a numerical perspective, it is better to zero out a large fraction of that thing before you start. Because the numbers that are so small that they can't possibly affect your answer at the end, they will either affect your answer, in which case a mistake has been made, or they won't affect your answer, in which case why are you summing them? And so zeroing out matrix elements has that same character. Sometimes zeroing out the matrix elements actually improves the accuracy of your calculation, even though you're making an unjustified step. Now, Going down that rabbit hole, you should only go down that rabbit hole if you really, really need to. And when we did this image modeling stuff where we did this, we really, really needed to. We had problems that weren't tractable until we did it. Um, OK, good. Um, that is just a sampling of things we know about linear algebra. There's lots more to know. And there's lots of things about structured matrices. There's matrices that, are, um, that have various uh, symmetries, strange symmetries, like that they can be written as exponentials of outer products of things. And there's various interesting symmetries that appear occasionally in data analysis. They all have special case solutions. And I'm not going to talk about any of those. And in fact, I don't really understand them. Um, but some of my former students understand them. So I can point you to resources if you do think you have structured matrices. Um, in my last few minutes, I'm going to say something about decision theory and model selection. Um, and then I'm going to give up. OK, here we go. So a situation which occurs a lot for all scientists is you have model 1, and it has its parameter vector theta 1. This is like some model. And you have model 2. And it has parameter vector theta 2, which is in general different from this parameter vector. So an example would be, this is the standard model of particle physics. And this is the next to next leading order supersymmetric model. So you've taken on a bunch of additional parameters here. Um, uh, and there's some set of data. But this is a more complex model. This is a less complex model. Um, uh, though still insanely complex. Another, uh, another common situation is this is li uh, like fitting a straight line to the data, and this is fitting a cubic to the data. Or this is fitting polynomials to the data, and this is fitting sines and cosines to the data. Those would be kind of data-driven data situations. But, um, uh, and then there's much more complex things. Like this could be a Gaussian process of one form. This could be a Gaussian process of another. This could be a machine learning method. and that, Like this could be deep learning and that could be whatever. So there's lots of different things, situations. But, but it also comes up scientifically like we've, we, this is the inverted hierarchy for the neutrino mass. And this is the normal hierarchy for the neutrino mass or whatever. There are lots of places where people are trying to decide between different options. Um, OK, now, there are many approaches to this problem. And, you can, and this is a huge literature. There's an infinite number of things to read if you choose to read it. Um, there is what, there, and the, the things I want to 
just touch on are what typical Bayesians say you should do and why they're wrong. Then I'm going to say what a true Bayesian would do and why it's impossible. And then I'm going to say what you should actually do if you are trying to make a very reliable choice. You ready? Okay. Here we go. OK, here's what a Bayesian, a typical Bayesian will say. A typical Bayesian will say, I want to compute the, basically the probability of H1 given my data. And I want to compare that to the probability of H2 given my data. And if you remember correctly, remember there was this numerical integral uh, z. There was this integral z that I needed to. This is asking, this equip question turns out to be mathematically equivalent to asking the z in case 1 versus the z in case 2. Um, and uh, there are several reasons this is a bad idea. This is what the typical Bayesian, this is like, this is like cartoon Bayesian. There are many papers that do this, by the way. This is absolutely standard practice in astronomy uh, and cosmology, and I think it is, it's essentially all wrong. And one of the reasons... One of the reasons this is wrong is these integrals are very hard to do. Notice, what is this integral? This integral is p of y given theta, comma, h1, p of theta given h1, d theta, integral, times all, times some overall probability for h1. It's this integral. That is this. Okay, now this integral is a hard integral because you have to do it over the entire parameter space. But it's also a very unstable integral because this thing is a prior that usually you've more or less made up. Right? You've said, ah, oh, well, we don't know much about this parameter, so we put a really wide Gaussian on it. But if you'd put a 10 times as wide a Gaussian on it, you would have. 10 times as low a value for this integral. And if you'd gone 10 times narrower, you'd have 10 times as high a value. So not only is this integral almost impossible to do in most cases, it's unbelievably sensitive to small choices you made here. So this integral is both impossible and exceedingly prior dependent. And of course, the Bayesians I know, the, Bayes the cartoon Bayesians I know say, but of course it's prior dependent. Everything's prior dependent, blah, 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 blah. But seriously, there's almost no problem I've ever had where I've known what to write here precisely enough to know what this integral is to a factor of 10, let alone accurately enough to make fine decisions. OK, so I'm just laying that out there to just warn you when you see this kind of operation or this kind of operation you are seeing something that has severe limitations. The people who are doing this are doing, usually they're nested samplers. In fact, most people using nested sampling are using it because they want to make this kind of comparison. And there's a bit of, actually a paper just came out a few days ago comparing in the exoplanet literature, comparing people's ability to do these integrals, and all the leading methods disagree at the factor of 10 level. Factor of 10 level, not 10% level. Um, so these integrals are really hard. In any real situation, these integrals are really hard. So I think it's just a mistake to be going down that path. Now, if you are a true Bayesian, true Bayesian, Oops. And a true Bayesian is a very hard way to live. If you are a true Bayesian, you would say, are you asking to make a decision between these two models? Because if you're asking to make a decision between these two models, you can't just compute probabilities. You have to compute something about your utility. After all, this model might be slightly more probable than this model, but this model might involve assumptions that are or this model might be almost impossible to calculate, for instance. 
Um, or uh, or if, you're, if you're choosing between these models to do some other thing, uh, you, might, um, uh, you might want that other thing to have some other properties. There might be some other considerations other than the pure probability of the model. In fact, there's kind of no way that the consideration can only be the probability of the model because you've been, you have to make decisions about like what you write in the abstract and things like that, and those are utility decisions. Um, another thing is this model, this model might be slightly preferred to this model, but this model might lead to many more predictions, many more useful things. This model might be much more productive and useful as a model than that one. Even if this one's marginally more probabilistic, or probable. So a true Bayesian would say, actually what you have is you have decision A and decision B. And you could call decision A, take model one, and decision B, take model two. But actually decisions are usually a little more complicated than that. <coughs> it's more like decision A is put into my code the code that computes model one, or put into my code the code that computes model two, or write in the abstract that model one is preferred, or write in the abstract that model two is preferred, or whatever. They, it's not exactly a model choice decision, but there's decisions. So these are decisions. And then there's probabilities. There's P of uh, theta one in the context of H1, given the data. And there's P of theta 2, given H2, or in the, in the context of H2, given the data. These are like posterior probabilities, not just over H1, but also over the parameters. And this is posterior, not over H, just over H2, but also over the parameters. And now we compute the utility of making decision A in the context of this posterior information. See? That's what I have to do. I have to write down my utility. It's possible my utility could just be uniform. Like, if your utility is uniform, then it reverts to this answer to this question. If your utility is truly uniform, it reverts to this question. Meaning you don't give a shit about which answer is right, you don't care about any values of the parameters, you don't care at all, you just want to find out the most probable model. That, I think, situation has never occurred in the history of mankind, but in principle it could occur. Um, but in most cases, you actually care. For instance, if this is the hypothesis the drug doesn't work, and here the hypothesis the drug does work, uh, you might think, oh, I just, wanna, I just want to commercialize the drug that works, not the drug that doesn't work. But the drug that works might work so minutely that it isn't worth the cost of promoting it. So you have a utility which depends on how effective it is. Is it effective or very effective? And that somehow enters into your utility. Other things enter into your utility than pure probabilities. Um, uh, and so what you do is you, you get to Bayesian decision theory. And that involves integrating utilities over these outcomes under the two decisions. You make this decision, integrate utilities, make that decision, integrate utilities, and you go with maximum expectation value. I'm not going to bother to write down the integrals because I want to say one more thing. But I will say that these integrals are impossible. Integrals are impossible. So they're same thing, impossible. They are, they are, I wouldn't, they're not quite as prior dependent as these integrals, but they depend on the product of the prior and utility, which turns out is just as bad. So they are exceedingly, exceedingly prior times utility dependent. And there's a worse thing, which is you never quantitatively know your utility. Who here has taken microeconomics? Oh, a few of you have. That's great. In economics, there's the concept of long-term the long term, there's short term, you know, when people do supply and demand curves, it's a short term decision. But then there's long term decisions that entities have to make. And the long term, in principle, your utility should always be a long term utility. You're trying to support your career. You can never know your long term utility. In fact, the definition of the word long term in economics is you don't know. That's the meaning of the word long term. So 
This is impossible. On the other hand, I have a paper that does this in the context of astronomy. Um, if you want to see it, it's a paper by Lang et al. And it's called astrometry.net. .net, colon, dot, 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 dot. Um, we wrote a software package that calibrates images. And the way it calibrates, the, the way it decides that it has correctly calibrated an image is by doing a Bayesian decision theory on its outputs. I think it's the only true use of Bayesian decision theory in all of astronomy. I don't know whether there's any uses in Actually, there's been some stuff in particle physics. There's been some discussion in particle physics of when you should stop looking for supersymmetry. Um, because as you keep looking, you're spending more money. Uh, and there's a kind of long-term discounted problem with spending the money looking for supersymmetry as it becomes less probable. Um, so I think there's been some discussion of, of uh, and this does come into those, that talk about a decision. You have to decide whether to keep running the experiment. That's a serious decision. It's a lot of money involved. And that's why these, really, you do have to think in terms of utility, and the utility is measured in dollars. By the way, utilities are measured in dollars. I didn't even say what a utility is. But anyway, utilities are measured in dollars. You can't do it if it isn't. Because usually you're comparing things that cost different amounts of money. It costs you different amounts of money to uh, predict something in the context of the standard model than it does to predict it in the context of, su of uh, supersymmetry, because the code is differently complex, and there's different numbers of parameters, and there's more data you need, and so on. OK. I'm going to say what I think you should do in most cases, and what I do in essentially all cases. Um, given that you don't really know your utility, and given that those integrals are very expensive and very prior dependent, what can you do that is much less prior dependent and, and gives you a default utility that is fairly reasonable, that a scientist or an engineer would fundamentally agree with? And I believe the solution to this is cross-validation. What is cross-validation? Cross-validation is you, you, take, um, you hold out subset, a subset k, which is in 1 to capital K. So you have a set of subsets of your data. You hold out one of the, so you have k, capital K subsets of your data like maybe 12 subsets of your data. You hold out 1 12th of your data. So you hold it out. You fit and predict the held out data. And I can put in a little 4k in k up front. You do this for each possible holdout. See? So. Does that mean that you're only fitting to one subset at a time, or you fit to all but the one subset? All but. You hold out this fit with not k. So meaning fit with all the, sub, all the data except subset k, and then you predict subset k. Okay. Yeah? Actually, this is, a, this is by the way, th there's a version of cross -valid, something that looks a lot like cross-validation called jackknife. So bootstrap is a way you can compute your errors empirically, your uncertainties empirically. Jackknife is a way you can compute. And you do the same thing for jackknife. And jackknife is one of the ways people estimate their uncertainties when they have outliers. So this is very sensitive to outliers. But that's good, because it shows you that your model is not capturing the outliers. So you'll do badly here if some of your subsets contain outliers. Because when they get included in the fit, they wrench the fit. And when they don't get included in the fit, they're badly predicted. See what I'm saying? So this is actually literally designed to be sensitive to outliers, because outliers are often the data points that tell you which model is the better model. So the model, that's a good example. You could do the model that we did on the first day with the quadratic and add an outlier model, and then do the cross-validation between when you do and don't have an outlier model. And if there are outliers, the outlier model will do better. 
and if there aren't. You see that's a qualitative difference, those two models? Quadratic plus outliers versus pure quadratic. And if we'd done that comparison, the model with outliers probably would have been a better fit to the data because there were some outliers. And, um, and it would have done better in prediction. Because in the prediction state, when the outlier was included, it would ignore it. Um, good. So this is very related. This is very related to two other methods that I did not talk about this week, which is bootstrap and jackknife. Which are two beautiful methods that both have a lot of um, statistics literature behind them. So if you, are having, if you do not believe your error estimates that are coming, or uncertainty estimates that are coming out of an, an analysis you do, they just seem too good to be true. I was asked to say, if your results seem too good to the, be true, they probably are. Um, uh, if they seem too good to be true, then try bootstrap, try jackknife. These are ways of assessing whether your uncertainty model is sensible. And there's a nice big literature on these, so you're not making shit up when you do these. You are appealing to a real literature. Um, similarly, cross-validation is a, in the same way that these are data-driven ways of asking what your uncertainties are, this is a data-driven way of determining which is the best model. And the reason cross-validation is a good idea is that if your model is not flexible enough, you will not predict any data well. It won't go through your data or whatever. Now you go to a much more flexible model, very flexible model. It always goes through the data just fine. But if it's too flexible, it will not be a, do a good job of predicting the held out data because it will have done so much work to fit through the data that weren't held out, it will miss the data that were held out. So it, it fi cross-validation finds an optimal model complexity between models that are too stiff to explain the data to models that are too flexible to predict the data. So this beautifully kind of captures our feeling as scientists that if a model is good, it predicts the data well. And um, so this is kind of, in my mind, this is an expression of pure pragmatism. It's literally an expression of pragmatism because it's saying, does the model do a good job of predicting new data? And I think if you think back, like why do we think, take all your closely held uh, scientific beliefs, you know, like the universe is expanding and, uh, and you know, um, th thermal, the, the thermal content of the room is related to the kinetic energies of the molecules. And like take your absolutely most well the things you most strongly believe, it's because you believe that it, they, they do good predictions on held out data. You see something new, it's well predicted by those things. Yes? Yes, this is exactly the method that is dominant in machine learning. And in fact, machine learning people ridicule Bayesian approaches um, because in part, but of course, it's in part because they can't compute them. Um, but it is in part because this really does get at from an <coughs> machine learning is very much an engineering discipline right now. Think of the companies that do machine learning, Facebook, Google, they're engineering companies. This is an engineer's description of what constitutes a good piece of code. And so all the sort of high-end machine learning, deep learning things you've seen on the internet are all uh, cross-validated. That is how people say, and when you do machine learning, if you do deep learning, you have a lot of choices. You're going to learn about that in a few weeks. You have tons of choices about how many layers and how many connections per layer, and you do, people do dropouts of various kinds. There's all sorts of choices you make when you do deep learning. Those choices are validated through cross-validation. Um, there's an even more severe version of this you can do than cross-validation, which is which is train, validate, and test, where you hold out a substantial validation set uh, completely and permanently, and you never look at it, um, which is a more complicated thing related to blinding and so on. So there's another, there's a more, um, there's a more uh, conservative thing you can do than cross-validation. But cross-validation kind of splits the difference between being very conservative and allowing you to use all your data. Because notice you still get to use all the data here. You just use it sequentially. Yes? If you're doing something like large structure CMB-based analysis, whatever, yeah. what 
data? Is it the summary statistics? Is it the raw data? What do you keep out? Good. There's a, the, one of the things that's nice about the question is of what data do you withhold or how do you subset the data or in what space do you subset the data? Great question. There's a big literature. All three of these things, bootstrap, jackknife, and cross-validation, involve subsetting the data. And there's a lot of theoretical re research on how you should subset the data. And in, in cosmology, the way people usually do it is by chopping up the sky because they are worried that the biggest systematics or the biggest problems with their experiment is that they're not observing each patch of the sky the same way. So we'll tend to chop things up on, by sky patches. So we'll, take, we'll fit the model with 11 twelfths of the sky and then predict the twelfth of the sky that we didn't see. Um, but, uh, so first of all, it's very interesting to split on the sort of parameter you're most nervous about in your data. Um, and that is a common thing to do. But I have to say, many of the machine learning people I network with say you should always split your data purely with a random number generator. And the reason they say that is they believe that your beliefs about your data are probably wrong, and the random number generator is more likely to hit issues than you are. So I don't really know. I don't have a strong opinion on this, but I do share the cosmologist's view that the sky, um, since I work on calibration of imaging, the fact that different patches of the sky were observed at different seasons uh, when the telescope was different dirty through different kinds of atmospheric makes me worried that different patches might not agree and so we usually cross-validate it on an a aspect of the data we're worried about um, but and then you sort of ask should you cross-validate on your summary statistics or on your raw data it's better be splitting in the raw level so you really want to split at the raw level and rerun your whole analysis from raw yeah. So how do you subset if your if your model is you're creating a simulation to compare to what you observe? Uh, well, it's still the case if if you have a simulate if you have simulated data, it's still the case that you can subset the simulated data okay. randomly or on volume patches. So it's still it's in general, yeah. So it, often we just I mean another thing that people do more and more now in in astronomy is they assign to every data point also a random number. And so in the database, like in the Gaia data that came out a few weeks ago, all of the, there's all this information for every star plus a random number. And then, and so every star has an additional data point, which is a random number. That's a very useful thing to do if you have a data set, by the way. Because first of all, you have to find that nothing depends on that random number. If anything depends on that random number, something's going seriously wrong. Second of all, it gives you a way to do this subsetting trivially because you can just ask for the, I just ask for the things where the random number is less than a twelfth, between one twelfth and two twelfths, between two twelfths and three twelfths. It trivially subsets your data. Um, it allows you to do fast queries in the SQL database because you can just take a small part of the data and so on. It has lots of good properties to keep a permanent number because then you can also, if you want to go to the really conservative form of, of train, validate, and test, where you make this three-way split of your data at the beginning and always f stay with it, you can also do that on that random number. So train can be where that number is less than a third. Validate can be for where it's one-third to two-thirds, and test can be where it's from two-thirds to one. Um, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good practices around these kinds of uh, methods, which I'm not an expert in, but I know people who are. Yes? Which of these categories Ah, uh, good. I didn't mention that. So the question is about information criteria. There's also several information criteria called AIC, BIC, and so on. Most of these information criteria are, they're things like, they're like chi-squared minus the number of degrees of freedom or chi-squared minus something times the number of degrees of freedom. These things are generally approximations, actually AIC, I believe, is an approximation to cross-validation. And BIC is an approximation to that. But those approximations are only true in extremely specific circumstances. So I would ordinarily say never use these, but I'm not going to say that because one advantage of these is they can be computed unbelievably fast. <laughs> 
And so if you're in a situation, we are sometimes in a situation where we're running code on millions of data sets and every data set we're making a decision, planet, no planet, planet, no planet, planet, no planet, planet, look, look, very, very rapidly. We often use these to make fast decisions and then follow the things up more carefully if they pass one of these fast decision cuts. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to mention that there are things like this. These are things where everyone ridicules them and I can join in in the ridicule, but they have a great benefit that they're super fast. And sometimes if you're running in the data center and you're running a lot of hypothesis tests, you just want something fast that's good enough. Yeah? Uh, since we're at the end, um, can I ask a more general question? Please do. Uh, so we'll end on this general question. So, so, so say, say you, you're reading some paper and you're kind of suspect of some claims. Yeah. They have posted their data. They've been yeah. available. What would you suggest to kind of do some kind of check or, or to be able to verify their claims? Good. The question is, if somebody's published a claim and you're a little suspicious of it and maybe there's some data online and so on, what should you do to verify the claims? Um, that is a great question. There's a whole kind of area that I work in at some level called reproducibility. And reproducibility is a very interesting subject right now in data science. And a lot of people who work in the interface of data science and the domains are thinking about reproducibility. So there's a really long set of stories there. We, in my group, we're trying to move to a state where every time we publish a paper, we also publish a, a code repository where you can more or less hit go in that repository and get the results. Now, we don't always succeed. Not all the projects meet those criteria. But more and more projects are thinking along these lines. When projects are, start to meet this criterion, the answer to your question is very simple. Git clone the Git repository, hit go, find the results, and then go into their code and ask, well, what if I'd made a different choice? What would look different? Um, we are nowhere, nowhere near that state. And, um, in for, th for the mass majority of things. And so I think there's no simple answer to that question. But, um, but one thing we've, we, one thing we do, you know, there's been a lot of questionable claims in cosmology in the last couple of years. And there's a cosmology discussion group in New York that meets across multiple institutions. And we discuss those claims. And a lot of what we end up doing is making hypotheses. Well, if this is true, then there should be a covariance between that and that. Or if that's true, you should find no slope if you plot this versus that. And we end up pulling the data and making plots that kind of test hypotheses. And in some sense, Checking a statistical claim is not unlike debugging a piece of code. And what, the way it goes is you should make hypotheses about what might be going wrong, like a scientific hypothesis, and decide what experiment you could do that would verify or disprove that hypothesis. So I, I, I usually recommend taking a kind of scientific method approach to asking whether a, a project is, has a, an error or has an has a unjustifiable assumption. Uh, but there's no general explanation, and one of the problems, especially when you're a young scientist, it's much more important to move forward your own science than criticize others. And in some ways, the absolute best thing to do if there's a claim you don't believe is take their data and do your own project on those data. And you know, a lot of my research is that. In fact, I, the hashtag other people's data is uh, uh, one I use because we take other people's data and redo the analyses ourselves with a different focus. But you know, in, in general, I think my advice, especially when you're young, is uh, do your own science. Just do it well. Um, and, the, and the reproducibility is helping us not because we're going to literally reproduce other people's results, but because we get access to the data. And we get access to the code. And we can make modifications and do new things. OK, good. Thank you for your patience and your time. It's been a pleasure.